Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second AATF Technology Tuesday webinar. Today, we have a great presentation from Siemens on social distancing in production. Our presenters for today are Hermes Hendrixa and Armand Duplessis from Siemens. Allow me to introduce them to you. Hermes Hendrixa was first exposed to digitalization technology in 2007, at which time he was completing his Bachelor of Industrial Engineering at the University of Pretoria. While completing his postgraduate studies, he continued implementing training and consulting on technology solutions in industries such as automotive, rail, heavy equipment, military, marine, mining, and CPG throughout South Africa as well as internationally. He currently holds the position of Portfolio Development Executive at Siemens Digital Industries Tech Software in Pretoria and is continuing studies in a Master's in Engineering focused on the digital enterprise. His professional goal is to bridge the gap between engineering, IT and business by leveraging technology to create tangible value. A little bit more about our month. Since his final year in getting his Industrial Engineering Bachelor's degree at the University of Pretoria, Armand Duplessis has been working with digitization technologies. Specifically, he did consulting and training services as a discrete event simulation engineer across multiple industries in South Africa. He now holds a position as a pre-sales solution consultant at Siemens Digital Industry Software, where his main goal is to tailor the correct technology to the needs of his customers to increase value and competitive advantage. Without further delay, we can now begin the presentation. Good day and a warm welcome to everyone joining today's webinar on simulating social distancing in production. My name is Hermias and I'm a business development executive for Siemens Digital Industry Software Solutions within the Middle East and Africa regions. I will be your host for today's session. I will start us off with setting the context of the webinar, and then I will hand over to my colleague Armand, who is our lead simulation engineer, who will be doing a live demonstration for the majority of the webinar. We will have a panel discussion around this topic following the demo, as well as a dedicated Q&A session afterwards. The audience scope is anyone interested in understanding the impact social distancing on production. This would ideally be the health and safety department of an organization working in conjunction with industrial or production engineers. The current requirement for them will be to answer questions related to social distancing. And this leads to our objectives of the webinar. These questions concern impact on production and determining contingency plans. But since all facilities differ, we will not be aiming to answer these questions directly but rather propose an approach that can be used, which would then be able to answer these questions. Before we start the demo, let's discuss the need in more detail. The manufacturing industry has many interrelated concerns regarding cost, safety, profit, and most importantly, and most relevant in the current economic environment, employee safety. The requirement is thus a tool that can help with answering all these aspects in conjunction and not only one at a time. We went through our entire software portfolio and we've recommended a tool for this. So the demo will consist of presenting the tool we recommended called Technomatics Plant Simulation, as it is an out of the box simulation tool and it's easy to use and extremely flexible. We will then go through how can we leverage built in functionality to simulate social distancing. So there's no need to develop a tool from scratch. And ideally, we want to keep leveraging this work that has been done for any future analysis. Finally, we'll show some more functionality that can be used to better understand and improve your production environment. Over to you, Armand. Thank you, Hermes. So what is Technomatics Plan Simulation? It is a discrete event simulation modeling software. And it focuses primarily on material handling and all of the processes that support that. So what does that mean? To illustrate that in a very simple example, let's build a small model. 
we'll need parts into our system. We'll need machines to process these parts. And we'll need those parts to exit the system somehow. If I connect all of these up, all that's left is for me to run the model. Okay, and it's done. So let's see what the throughput of this system is. All of the machines have built-in statistics in them. The total throughput of the system is 1,437, but that's a bit of an unrealistic number in our scenario, because if I open up any of these machines, you'll see that they have a constant processing time of one minute. That means that if, for example, 300 parts go through the system, all 300 parts will be processed exactly one minute. We want to change that. We want to make it a bit more realistic according to the real world. If we come in, we can change our processing time and we can select from a number of different uh, statistical distributions. We want to select normal distribution. And I changed it once, but it has propagated throughout my entire system because plant simulation is object orientated. If I rerun, and we look at the throughput now, we'll see that the total throughput has gone up to 1,893. So our statistics have had a, a positive change in our system. But what does that look like? Now that we have variance in our system, looking at one measure doesn't tell us the full story. So plant simulation has something called a bottleneck analyzer. I could just drag and drop it in here and ask it to show me what the analysis of the system is. If I zoom in a bit, you'll actually notice that it has different colored bars. On the far left, there's a yellow bar. This means that this machine is blocked. It has parts and it's ready to pass these parts onto the succeeding process or machine. But that process or machine is busy for some reason and it can't and it needs to wait there. Green means that uh, in station that it's processing most of the time and gray means that it's waiting, right? So it's ready to receive parts from the uh, preceding process or machine, but it can't because that machine for some reason is busy with something else. So let's say that our process owner comes to us and asks us, um, they want to see if they can resolve this blockage on station one. They want to know what the effect will be if they put a buffer just before station two. Okay. So I can just switch over to 2D at any time. I can drag and drop a buffer in between. I can make it look pretty. And all I need to do is rerun it. And now when we look at the throughput, we'll see that yet again, it has gone up. The total throughput has gone up to 2,031 units. So that's fantastic, it had a positive change. If we look at what that looks like, we'll see that the blockage has been completely alleviated here. Now the process owner comes to you and sees this and he sits down with his engineers and they decide that they wanna run a process improvement initiative. They want to see if they can remove the blockage on station. Uh, specifically, they want to um, improve the processing times. But before they even touch the real world process, before they do all that time and effort and money, they want to know what should they be aiming for? What will their results be? And will their results yield enough for them to warrant the effort that they're putting in? So for that, we'll be running different experiments. Plant simulation has a built-in object for this as well. It's called an experiment manager. And to run different experiments, we need to tell it what our output will be. Our output will be the throughput of the system. Our inputs will be the variance of the processing time. 
Now we need to define our experiment. And we just need to run it. And here it is. Again, uh, our input here was the variance. So the variance of the processing time, we start with the initial value and we decreased it in increments of five. And here's the output right next to it for every experiment that is the throughput. And as predicted, it goes up. To be a bit more specific, this is what it looks like with variance. And now you can have a better discussion with your process owner. He, uh, he, and he can sit with his engineers and they can tell you that maybe experiment four's variance is quite achievable for them. Um, it won't cost a lot and it won't be a lot of effort for them to do that. And they'll have a quite a, a, quite a big increase in throughput for their effort. But the variance of experiment five to achieve that, they might actually have to buy a completely new machine. And now you can start doing cost benefit analysis and see what should you be aiming for. To come back to our model here, uh, plant simulation also has an energy analyzer. So if I drag and drop that in right here, you'll see that if I open up any of my machines and actually every machine, you can track their energy independently. What, a, what is the energy it's pulling when it's starting up, when it's running idle, when it's at full production and so forth. So here, all we need to do is tell it to look at these objects. We rerun our model. We ask it to show us what this looks like. So now, here you can see in 3D very quickly that station and station two are consuming more power than just station. If we want to be a bit more specific, we can go in, in depth in built-in charts and it tells you what uh, power consumption different states of these machines are giving you, which is fantastic. Okay, it's also pretty easy to add workers to our system. All I need to do now is add football to them to go to. And I just need to tell the machines that they have a worker helping out with processing. If I run this a bit slower for you to see, here you can see the worker's dynamically finding its path to every machine and you'll see in a minute when this worker moves out from this station that I can actually select these machines and I can move it while the model is running and see what the change is. You see here, it walks around the machines. It automatically picked up the, where the new route is. If I can show you, these are the barriers around the machines. The, they are actual obstacles for this worker. And that gives us a nice indication of where workers should be working. This is a great segue into our Next model, which is the social distancing model. So here we have a factory and they're producing ventilators here. As I zoom in, I just want you to notice that we can run full 3D models. So if you have 3D models of your actual factory, outside factory walls of your machines, and we can go into more detail as well as I zoom in here. You can see that we can pull in the data, detail of the workers, 
as well as full 3D of your parts. Here's the ventilator. So if I run this model, here you'll see these workers have red lines around them. That indicates the minimal distance that these workers need to keep from each other for social distancing to occur. You'll also see that whenever they move past each other and those red lines cross, that a red dot, a red circle filled with red is painted on the ground. This indicates that that minimal distance was crossed. And that's nice, because if I speed up here, you'll, you'll see that uh, more red dots are filled in this space, which makes space which makes sense. It's an enclosed space for these workers to work in and they need to walk between different stations to do their work. Um, but now this is fantastic. It's a visual way of just showing where uh, these distance violations are occurring and that can help you with planning your processes more effectively. I actually ran this model completely and here you see that the area is completely filled with red. So obviously this is a hot zone. We have the throughput here of the system. Uh, 187 ventilators were produced. And what's nice is we don't just show the distance violations that occur. We actually count them as well. So, and this can change per simulation run depending on how you change your model, right? So here we have 1,139 distance violations. And what's nice is you'll see we can actually set the minimal distance. So in our case, it's 1.5 meters. Right, this is important because different regions have different uh, minimal distances that they have to adhere to uh, in different countries. So this is fantastic, but now we'd like to improve this. We want to run different scenarios. So the first scenario that I show you guys is this. Here we have screens or barriers in between the workers to protect them from each other and the spread. Right, and we want to see, uh, we know that this could protect them, right? This is being implemented everywhere, and, but we want to know what effect this could have. And it's nice that we, these are objects, we can move them around per simulation run as we need to, right, to make our model more effective. But I already ran this model, and here you can see that the throughput has decreased by only one unit. And, but the effect on the distance violations has reduced by almost half to 551 for the same minimal distance. That's fantastic. That means with no change to throughput, we have made the area safer for our employees, right? So that's fantastic. But now we wanna run a few different experiments. We wanna see how many workers should this system be holding in and with different time amounts of workers, what, what will the effects be on the system and on health and safety, right? So that, that's the big question, throughput and health and safety at the same time, right? Uh, because different levels of lockdown require different levels, amounts of people to be in the system. So here I've already run an experiment. Here you can see the input is the amount of workers. It goes from three and it increments, in, increases in increments of one all the way to 10. The outputs are throughput as well as the amount of distance violations. With this, I just want to highlight that we can run experiments with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Let's look at the throughput first. Here you can see something interesting. Experiment one had three workers, and when we go to experiment two, which is four workers, there's quite a big jump. After that, it, it slightly starts to increase on average. But uh, just with one look, we can see that uh, four workers might be a sweet spot for us. Okay, but what about health and safety, right? So here we have the distance violations that occur for the different amounts of workers. Um, you can see it increases, right? And then eventually it actually starts to decrease on average, and then it just starts to decrease all the way to experiment eight, which is 10 workers where there is no distance violations. And the reason for this is because there are 10 working stations and there's enough workers in the system that all the work can be done without workers needing to move around, in our example, at least. Right, so let's say we decide that experiment two, four workers, we're happy with that. We have a 
big increase in throughput, but uh, we feel that it's still safe enough. But we'd like to increase the safety measures even more for our employees. So let's go to the, to the last experiment. So let's say we have a scenario where we have to consider different types of COVID PPE for employees. If they have full body PPE COVID protection, it costs more, it's more expensive. However, they can come closer to each other, right? They can work in tighter spaces. And as they have less and less and less uh, COVID PPE on until they just have their normal PPE, the minimal distance that they have to keep to each other increases. This is what's happening here. We're increasing the minimal distance as an input here by 0 0.2 meters. And then as an output, we're looking at the distance violations, which predictably are increasing. If we look at it more specifically, now we can have an interesting discussion and see that is it worth having uh, on experiment one, the very expensive COVID PPE, as opposed to um, experiment four and seven. Here you can have an interesting discussion that might be a, a sweet spot that's 0 0.4 meters to 1.6 meters. After that, I would say it, it starts getting um, dangerous for the employees because it starts increasing the amount of exposure, starts increasing exponentially. And lastly, I just want to finish off with this. So we went from a tiny model to a bigger single example. And here's a full model, uh, a typical size of model. Models can be much, much larger. But this is just to show that we can have multiple inputs. We can have hundreds of objects running at the same time. And we can have hundreds of outputs at the same time as well. Uh, the more complex your model is, the more value you will get from a simulation model. Just to highlight, here we have, we've got forklifts. We've got robots. We have overhead cranes, conveyors all running at the same time. Here you can see we've got workers with different skills working at different uh, machines. They even have overlapping skills. We've got buffers, we've got different machines with different processing times. And then we kind of finish off here. We have AGVs feeding a warehouse, a uh, fully automated warehouse. And with that, I'll finish off and give over to Hermes. Thank you so much for that. That was extremely informative. Um, joining the discussion this morning is Gary Lane from Gary Lane Vuma Collaborations and Marco Cosaro from Rotec Escom. Thank you for joining us. We will now be taking live questions for our panelists. Please use the chat box and type out your questions. Um, please also take note that there is um, a poll coming onto your screen. If you could please participate in the poll, we really value your feedback. Um, and we use this feedback to improve our webinars from the one session to the next. Thank you. I'm just waiting for the questions to come in while everyone is completing the poll. Okay, we've received our first question. The webinar is based around simulating social distancing in production. Do you see other applications outside of the production environment? Demius, would you like to take this? I'd, I'd like to, to take it and, and pass it straight on to Marco. I know he has experience in multiple industries. So, so Marco, what, what are your thoughts around this question? Uh, yes, um, well, from from the manufacturing industry, I think I think it can it can be shared into the into many of the service industries, um, in particular restaurants. 
um, where, where social distancing is is quite important. Um, airports, um, which I saw um, when there was a whole uh, terrorism issue that we had to uh, redesign the security of, of Seattle Airport and it made a huge input on throughput, which is similar to what's happening now with COVID, um, is, is you're going to have a lot, lot more uh, things that need to be done in order to ensure that uh, things are clean and there's no spread of the pandemic. So yes, definitely uh, this model can be applied to many industries, um, airports, uh, service industry, call centers, I mean, these, these uh, systems and layouts were designed pre-COVID, so I, th I think there's great value in simulating them and seeing what the effect of the, the new regulations are. Okay. Okay, good. Um, thank you for that. Um, we have another question from the audience. Everyone is talking about digitalization. Where does this type of simulation modeling fit into the bigger picture? Gary, I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you guys at Boomer, you, you talk about digitalization, how to enable companies. So how do you see this fitting into that, that bigger picture as in the question? Yeah, so, so Hamish, thank you for that. I mean, I think simulation has been used um, a lot. In, if you look at the last 20 years, simulation has been used a lot by it. But it's generally been sort of the, the, the smart engineer sitting in the corner office that's been doing simulation. And I, I really think that simulation needs to be brought into the mainstream where it's a fundamental tool that's used for proper decision making because if you think about it you can literally simulate your whole business and all the aspects around throughput people equipment utilization and and test decision making and testing your levers to really rigorously work out whether your tactical decisions and strategy will actually generate value so i think it needs to become a more useful tool mainstream and not just in the in the corner office of the smart engineer. Okay, great, that's fantastic. Um, we have another question from the audience that says, uh, do you see a measurable value in simulating social distancing? I think um, Gary and Marco, between between the two of you, I see something that's, that's asked quite a lot is, Simulation modeling, it looks cool to understand the value, but can you measure it? Can you do an ROI calculation? So what, what's your, your experience or your feedback on that? So, um, so Mark, okay. should I go first? Because I know you and I have done a bit of work together as well. Um, yeah. So look, my view is simulation is a critical aspect. Um, I think a lot of businesses don't understand the value that can be harnessed from it. I mean, in reality, if you build a proper simulation model, you can replicate right to the point of profit and you could test all your decisions. So I think the ROI is easy, actually, if you, if you build the, the right simulator. I mean, I think what's critical is to understand what is the objective function you're trying to analyze by doing the simulation. I think that's a, a critical starting point. Um, I, Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, yeah further to what Gary said, a, a simulation will quantify the changes. So. Uh, if you're going to if you're going to be spending money, um, the simulation will actually give you a, a resulting throughput, uh, an actual number, an actual utilization of your workers. So you can justify capital expenditure, and you can you can maybe block some regulations that that have been forced upon you, that will actually cripple your business. Yeah, and you can explain to the customer why things aren't coming out out of your out of your process. So it's 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 a all encompassing tool. Well, great. Those are great uh, ideas on measurement. Um, I see we've got some more questions here. Uh, which industries do you think will benefit from the simulation? Yeah, that's, um, I think that's, that's a very broad, broad question. So again, let's, let's have an open discussion of, let's, if you had to pick one industry, just from the news, from what's going on, which one, if you have to pick one, and don't pick the same one now. So whoever goes first gets to pick the first one. Okay. But which, which industry would you pick where you think simulating social distancing specifically could really, could really help them out? Well, yeah, I, I think from, yeah, from a macroeconomic view, uh, mining is quite important. And I think 
I think mining needs to be modeled in detail because you've got certain tonnage that, that your customer's expecting and uh, it's quite difficult because you can only have so many people in a cage. Uh, you've, got, you've got air which stays underground for up to two hours. So I think mining for the country is, is important. For people, I think restaurants, uh, airports. Gary? Hmm. No, thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, I was going to choose mining as well. I, I mean, I think mining is such a critical aspect of the Southern economy um, and, and it employs so many people. And I mean, so I, I think I would have, I would model mining. Um, I think that's a critical aspect. Um, I mean, there's two aspects. One is the, the safety of people in terms of measuring um, uh, uh, social distancing um, and, and the 1.5 meter separation, you know, if you're looking at engineering technicians and, and production techs, um, but the other thing is, how do you actually achieve full production with maybe reduced um, resourcing and with social distancing? And on top of it, you know, some of these mines are busy ramping up from being shut. You need to be modeling the actual ramp up again to get to that maximum production as quick as you can. So I think mining. But look, I think if you have a look at it, any industry that's got lots of people, um, manufacturing, critical, critical. Um, as Marcus said, airports, uh, restaurants, um, anything that employs a lot of people, I think simulation right now for COVID is a critical, critical thing for us to be simulating. Yep, so, so if I can just add to that from the presentation, the software being used, Technomatics, is, is quite strong on modeling of people movement. Um, so I, I, th I think that it's the right tool for, for modeling how people queue, the congestion, and it, it, it takes into consideration the, the intelligence of people that they can move around barriers and what have you. So it's a good, good tool for modeling an airport, I would say. I've worked with it, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Any feedback from any of the other panelists? Uh, I think maybe I'll just quickly jump in here. Um, I'm not sure if you've already said this. But obviously, um, I think the places where the, I would say the regulations, at least in South Africa, are the strictest at the moment is hospitals. You, know, you can be in any other place in your province and yes, they might stop you at a uh, shopping mall. They do have the regulations, but the moment you go near any hospital or in a hospital, uh, you definitely feel a, a tangible difference in the atmosphere. Uh, they, they need to follow the rules more strictly it's hot zones there's a lot of more people in those areas so i personally think that um hospitals it, it can definitely be because we're working here with um just like marco said we can work here with different employees as well as spatial awareness right so we can pull in the building as well and uh, existing buildings and we can look at how you know different shifts how different people moving through the corridors how different um now, where do you put what people, where do people come into your system and where do they leave and what, what effects will that be? I mean, you can even track because COVID, the spread of COVID, right, at least through uh, air particles, it, le it leaves a, resi a, res a residue, sorry, in the air, right? And that residue stays there for a while. So you can track that as well. I know in the model, we show that you can paint on the ground physical spots where this happens. But something cool you can also do is you can actually um, keep data and say like, and um, visually show where these residue uh, spots are and how long are they there in the air for. And you can show as well how they diminish over time. So instead of just knowing, okay, this is a hot zone, you can start knowing, okay, this is really, uh, the air particles have reduced in this area. You can start moving through the system again. Yeah, I, I did notice that from the presentation. My thoughts were that this, the software could easily um, model, so say, an airport, and then you, you create like a, a patient zero in there. So someone comes in with COVID, and then what you do is you run a scenario of, say, um, people rushing to the plane. And at the end of the day, you could have a, a projected how many infections. Then you run the same volume of people, but with a different layout, different policies, and you see, oh, a lot less people infected. Yeah. That's, that's within the software, I think. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so on that, we, you were talking about the policy. So something that we can do, for instance, is so you can have it before and after. So before would be, okay, how quickly it spreads. And then after we can have 
uh, something, a policy, for instance, right? So, and obviously these are things that you can change as you, as you need for your situation. But one policy could be, for instance, how quickly do they pick up on patient zero, right? And then how quickly do they start isolating these people, right? And then how, uh, when do they start putting in certain policies? in place, self-isolation, uh, quarantine of certain areas and people as well. And then you can see, does that have an effect, yes or no, on the diminishing returns of the spread of COVID in that area? Okay, good. Um, our next question, um, I think sort of follows on from what you've just discussed. Can the virtual software be outsourced to be used by companies to create a model for social distancing? I think if, if I can just grab this question. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's meant by outsourced. They are, uh, let's say the, the ideal business model or the typical business model is companies in investing these in the software themselves. Obviously with the current timelines, it'll be difficult to actually invest, train up something, someone and have the capability to build this in-house. But something we, we do offer is uh, almost like a consulting service where we can go into companies and help them build, build a model. Uh, so that it's, if anybody's interested, my details are on the screen. They can drop me an email and we can, we can discuss it uh, a bit further. Thank you, Hermes. I mean, the same attendee have also asked the question, where can the software be sourced from? I'm assuming they can obviously get in touch with your email or with you via email. Um, is there an alternative way to reach you? Uh, email is, is usually uh, the preferred method. Uh, there is actually trial software. If you Google um, plant simulation trial, there is a 30 day trial available for free for download. Um, the, the library for social distancing is also available online. Uh, so that's why I'll recommend that people, they just drop us an email. We can send them all the links and but we'll have to help them get up and running if they want answers quite quickly. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, our next question asks, uh, should the business also model common areas like the cafeteria or is the main priority the modeling production area? Okay, so I'll, I think I'll grab this one. Uh, it depends, like Gary said in the very beginning, it depends on your objective. So you always start a model with uh, what is the objective? What are you trying to achieve? So it's, if it's going to, if your cafeteria is in the middle of your building and everybody needs to pass through it to get to everywhere else, then yes. And if it's an area, for instance, if you have a company and if the cafeteria is on the side or it's locked down and no one goes there, you won't model it. But if it's crucial and people move through it and it's part of your system and you also have you have the dimensions of it or even 3d data available then yes you can quite easily model it as part of your system definitely absolutely and with social distancing measures in place obviously we can minimize any impact on production and productivity in the workplace and um, we only have one question left unless the audience is fast enough to type some more for us um, the last question says Siemens has the technology to track actual worker movement uh, through your RTLS or your real-time location. And this can then be fed back into the model to keep it up to date and accurate. Do you think South African companies in general have the right digital maturity to leverage this? Uh, the, yeah, that's, that's quite a long question. But I think what it, what it actually alludes to is that digital maturity discussion. Um, I know Gary has this all the time, Marco and I, we, we have, we used to have lunch all the time, we can't right now, to, and we discuss around this. So I think adding over uh, to you guys, from, from a South African perspective, specifically, and this will be different across companies and across industries, but if you could comment on how do you experience digital maturities in different places? Um, I think focusing uh, focusing question around that because I think that could have a lot of value. Yeah, so let me let me let me get an attempt to that first, and then Marco, you can come in from there, and you guys we can have a chat about it. Um, look, I think all companies, um, you know, if you have a look at at all the reports over the last couple of years, and from Deloitte to McKinsey, um, digital it's sort of digital um, 
project pipeline and, and this digital strategy is probably number one in most of the CEOs uh, priority lists. So if you have a look at mining, um, we, we are now tracking all the trucks um, in the plants, uh, in the operation with fleet management systems. So, you know, there is a little bit of overload of, of, of digital solutions. And I think there's an, a, some question around real value out of some of them, but I think that um, one of the challenges to, to with tracking every aspect of an operation, especially the people, is you'd actually tackle issues around unions. Um, I know there were some articles out of Australia recently, I think it was Rio, where they were going to start tracking people and there was a massive backlash because it's this whole concept of big daddy. So I think the, the, the technology exists. We do have challenges around actual tracking of people. Um, I know in the mining industry, they're starting to track, um, you know, um, fatigue in the, in the vehicles. So that if somebody's eyes are starting to close, it will alarm so that we can prevent fatalities. Even that is, is there's quite a pushback from unions because there's a feeling that we, we, we are, uh, or the industry is now tracking people. And if they've caught getting sleepy, they're going to get fired. So I think it, it's not just about digital maturity. There's an issue around the unions and the people change management side. All right. Mark out if you the unions are extremely strong. So anything that's that's real time and what have you, you're gonna get in trouble with the unions. Um, also my opinion is um, the way we build a model is uh, we, we 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 bring in all the, the business rules, we bring in the process times and they, they, they're an estimate of when we build the model. And then what we do is we'll, we'll make, do experiments to, like Amon showed you, um, to, to get the best, the best way forward of operating. So it's a snapshot, um, and then the CEO will make a decision, yes, we'll add that machine, or we'll add more trucks to the mine, or, or what have you. So it's, it's a decision tool. So to have a model that's, LinkedIn with real-time data is is I, I, I think it's 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 quite a difficult thing to do and I'm not really sure about the value of it because so, so it's time to make a decision then what you do is then you go and update all your inputs in terms that you're capturing your process times your business rules and then you'll you'll you run the scenarios and make the best decision so it, it's a nice to have and it's it'll probably best be in in the automotive industry where it's data rich but generally, um, models are fine with just an update of, of your inputs, just a, a quick scan through and a revalidation of the model. Could I, could I just come back and, and just give one comment on that, Marco? And uh, my, my end vision of where this is going to go, all right, is that before any mining activities take place, right from drilling through blasting, loading, hauling, whether it's underground or open pits, um, I think we should be having simulations. So we simulate the mine plan based on maintenance strategies. Everything needs to be simulated. And once we have, and, and this is going to be a journey. I mean, step one would be let's simulate and do operational planning via simulation and not, let's not do GAN scheduling. Um, and in fact, the, the simulation will generate the mine, the mine plan and the task schedules and everything. Um, the end game actually is that there's a smart, a smart simulation controller that's sitting above a mine making real-time decisions about task allocations as things are happening that's probably still years out but that would be the end game um, eventually yeah i think okay good um i see that we have one more question that's snuck in via the chat box um and the question is how does routine and emergency maintenance get modeled in Okay, so I'll, I'll grab that. Um, so first of all, on a, high, on a high level, what you'll do at first is you'll put in your failures into the system, the different machines and different things that can go wrong. So that's the first thing you'll, you'll model and you'll run that and you'll see what the effect is on, on the system. After that, you can, um, you can put in planned maintenance as well. So there's two, two strategies to this. There's a reactive strategy. So you can have people go fix your, um, your maintenance team, they can reactively uh, go fix the failures in your system so you can see what the effect is 
of that is as well. But you can also with a schedule uh, very easily because typically, you know, depending on the data. So if they have a lot of data, we can easily run one year, two years, five years worth of uh, simulation runs. If they don't have a lot of data, that's also fine. What, what's nice about a, a model is you can use a data to validate what the data should look like as well. That's a bit of a different type of model. But typically what we do then is we'll put in a schedule, we'll run it for a year or two, and then we'll, we'll see what the effect is of different times of when they put in um, the maintenance, especially on, on throughput and the rest of the environment. So for instance, if you have multiple different machines and uh, they interlock with each other, obviously if you take one down, that has an effect downstream to the other systems as well. And, and those are the type of questions that are important with planned maintenance, especially like it's, it's fine if you have a job shop where one machine goes down, but you still have three other machines to cover it. That's fine. But the moment you have interlocking systems and critical parts and bottlenecks, that's really where the value comes in from running a maintenance, a planned maintenance ahead of time. And then you can start um, playing around with the maintenance as well and seeing what, what would be the best time. And typically you don't just do uh, just planned maintenance, you'll do planned maintenance and then as well, on top of that, we'll put failures into the system and say like, okay, but there's unexpected things that will happen as well. How will the system react? Um, to go and fix that reactively, at least. Could I could I add, Armand, um, and Armand's touched on it. I, I think there's a massive opportunity. I mean, when it comes to asset maintenance strategy, I think we 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 quite poor at it. I think the leaders of in that era are probably um, the motor industry. But if you have a look at a value stream, um, you don't just do maintenance on everything based on mean time to failure. If you understand where your constraint is and you can model different types of maintenance across different pieces of equipment across the value stream, understanding where the constraint is. You can now adapt your asset strategy because some of the equipment could break down if it doesn't, if it has catch up capacity in the context of an overall system. So that's one important aspect of simulation. I think we 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 haven't we don't do asset management strategy well. The second thing is we don't use the current data we've got. I can tell you based on all the work I've done globally across multiple industries, we're not using any of the data we've got. You could just take down the um, historical breakdown data, for example, build a probability distribution on it, and that could be input into the model. So you could now um, have an asset management strategy, bring in the historical um, breakdown probability curve, um, which you can input into the model, and now model what that actual system's capability is based on all the historical data. All right. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, <laughs> I'll also jump in back again. Um, we, we, we've had, um, we've had people come to us and then they, they planned out their entire facility. So they, they're planning a completely new facility and they did capacity planning in Excel. And it's this one machine is going to do X amount of processing and that's it. But you know, processes don't work with that. There's variance in systems, there's interlocking systems. And, um, as you guys can see in the models that we showed as well, it's, the variance of the processing that's being done, but it's also spatial distance that you need to take into account. It's workers that need to take parts or forklifts that need to take parts from one end to another end. A lot of people don't take that into consideration. And now all of a sudden you build your entire system on a fixed capacity. You don't know where your bottleneck is sitting. And then when you run, uh, when you actually build the system, put in all of that capital and you run it, all of a sudden you realize, oh, my, my capacity is way too much. We wasted money or we don't have enough capacity. We're running into issues that we now have a bottleneck where we didn't realize we had one previously as well. And now all of a sudden, after the fact, reactively, we have to come in and look at the system and they know the system is much more complicated. And so you have to then run and model and then see, okay, this, th these are the strategies that we can adapt to. And that's, that's just something that I, that I want to highlight because yeah. Gary is talking about the, you know, the potential of the maintenance and how we can use that. And uh, it, it doesn't have to be, like Marco said, we, you know, with the real time um, monitoring and that stuff, you know, there's different levels. So maturity isn't just one question, right? You, you're constantly changing your maturity of your com company and you're constantly going from one level to another level. So if, you're, uh, if you don't have a lot of data, that's fine. Like Marco said, we can come in and 
on a high level, start modeling your systems, just so that you can understand what is happening. Sometimes the biggest realization as clients get from modeling their system is just what is actually happening in the system. That's sometimes one of the biggest things that they happen. And I know that people want to get the ROI out of, uh, you know, what, what is the ROI, but just understanding what's going on in your system is sometimes one of the biggest questions because when we go through this entire plan of building a, a model, afterwards they'll come and say, oh, we didn't even know it works like this because systems can be complex, right? So many interlocking parts. All of a sudden there's capacity that's lying on the floor that you're not using, right? That can, um, like Gary always says, you know, uh, wait before you just invest into uh, capital. You know, what, what is the capacity that's already in your system? C can you use that to push your throughput two times, three times more already? And, and that's really, I think, starting point for maturity is just understanding what is your system? How does it look? How does it, all of the different system components lock into each other? And then how can we, you know, how can we streamline that? that? Where's the bottlenecks? Where, where can we free up capacity in our system to do more processing? How do we planning go, do planning going forward as well? And then you, on a later stage, when you're much more competitive, right? When you're, um, when you're competing world-class com uh, uh, level competitiveness, right? And you have ERPs and MES systems in, and you have so much data that you don't know what to do with it. Then things like real-time monitoring comes into play. Then you can link it in. Ideally, you want to come to a place, like Gary said, where you have a updated model of your entire system. And you, every three or six months, you update this model to reflect currently what the system is looking like. And before you do any OPEX or CAPEX projects, you come in and you consult it first through the model. Um, because it, this is a game of, of money, right? At the end of the day, uh, you don't want to go actually change something in your system, especially if it's a complicated interlocking system, right? If you change something and it doesn't work, that was time, money, and effort that you've wasted. Now, after the fact, you need to react to that and change it. And now, fine. We've had people come to us and say, oh, we, we've done, gone through the entire project. We want to put in this machine. Can you simulate it so that we can prove that we can put it in? And then we do. And then they realize it doesn't have that big of an effect because that's not where the bottleneck is, right? So they're losing capacity at another place, for instance. And they could have avoided all of that if they, if they you know, did their planning properly from the very beginning. So... Okay, thank you so much, guys. I think the essence there is that um, maintenance um, and routine maintenance and emergency maintenance needs to be part of the planning process. Um, uh, otherwise, you will see uh, your production uh, not operating at capacity or at its highest levels all the time. Um, I think that brings us to a close. Uh, thank you for attending our second AATF Technology Tuesday. And thank you to Siemens and our panelists for an informative and knowledge sharing session. We would also like to remind everyone about our next AATF Technology Tuesday presented by Adroid on the 14th of July. The information should be up on your screen shortly. Um, and if you watch out for our social media channels, you'd be able to uh, see all the registration links for that Tuesday session. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.